Sego. I'm John Kane, and I welcome you to Let's Talk Native on this Tuesday, May 14th. While this program may not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment, we do encourage, and in some cases, start conversations. We don't do prayers, and we don't do buffalo speeches. We take a tough look at history, oppression, and survival. We talk about culture, the arts, politics, and identity, and we may step on a few toes along the way. But our real goal here is to bring people together by breaking down what separates us. We will take on the false narratives and provide critical thinking to all that is heaped upon us. And we do it all right here from the Cattaraugus Territory of the Seneca Nation. So let's talk native. But first, let me remind people that you can catch our audio streaming on our website, which is www.letstalknative.com. And we also stream video of the show on Facebook Live on, my, on a variety of group pages. Uh, we take that video and we post it up on our YouTube channel later on so you can catch us uh, after the fact on our YouTube channel, which is Let's Talk Native TV. And the audio goes up on a podcast. So if you want to search for Let's Talk Native Podcasts on your favorite podcast platform, you can find our shows there as well. And that also, those podcasts also include my shows in New York as well. So uh, I am the host of Let's Talk Native, and I'm assisted in studio by Jake Proud, who is uh, managing our video and our sound. Um, opened up with uh, Highway 16 from Murray Porter's latest uh, CD, his his newly released release CD, which is Stand Up, and that's uh, Highway 16, which is his song that he's got dedicated towards missing and murdered Indigenous women, which is what I plan to talk about today. Um, and I'm going to take on the tough subjects uh, associated with it because, you know, it's it's oftentimes real easy to talk about social injustice and uh, and and the wrongs committed. Um, uh, against us by the outside, by law enforcement, by you know racism, by colonialism. Um, but at some point, we become part of the problem. And we not only become complicit with violence that uh, is perpetrated against women, we ignore it when it's our brother or our buddy or our nephew or our sons. Um, but we get really we we get outraged when when that violence is perpetrated against our daughters and our and our nieces and uh, and you know our, and the the women in our family our sisters. So, is there any time that it's acceptable? Of course not. So, when do we step up? When do we step up? And it's not just men who look the other way on their buddies. I mean, we I've seen it on many of our territories where where a mother defends the actions of her son. Yeah, if her son is involved in uh, perpetrating violence against his uh, the mother of his uh, of his children, you know, I've I've heard aunts and and mothers and grandmothers say, "Well, she deserved it." Well, no, there's never a time. There is never a time that a woman deserves to be the victim of violence by uh, uh, by a man or oh by anybody really. So, what do we do? How is it? What do we do to step up? I mean, we know. The seventy percent of the domestic violence against uh, against native native women on native territories is perpetrated by non natives, but thirty percent are some are people who look just like us. So, how do we deal with that? I mean, we, we've seen it for years and years where we've looked the other way when we've seen you know our relatives or our friends <clears throat> you know get into whether they were drunken confrontations or or whatever whatever the situation is where domestic violence arises, we say, well, it's not my problem. It's not, that's not my household. I'm not going to get involved. Well, when do we get involved? You know, my, my, my buddy, Paul, uh, he tells a story about, um, uh, about being a, a, a father of a, of a little girl who lives next to another household where there's a little boy and they can hear the the violence you know and the and the, and the domestic disturbances taking place next door and you know and, and at some point the, there's that question well when do you do something do you do and the little girl asked the father you know should we you know, should you do something and you know and it's really easy to say no 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 that's that's their business it's none of my business what happens in that household well the little girl and little boy are friends and 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 as time goes on and and they get rom- romantically involved and that boy who is now a man starts abusing that little girl who's now a woman. Now the father of that little girl, that father of that woman, does he now say it's not, it's not his problem and he shouldn't be involved. See, this is the thing. 
we need to we need we need to be clear that this behavior is unacceptable. So, and I'm not going to just you know beat on our own people uh, for, through the whole program, but but I feel it's really really necessary to understand that this violence that happens against our women doesn't happen in a vacuum. Many of us are aware of it, and, and you know, and to the extent that you know th- that there are, are pressure points and and there's there's tensions. You know that sometimes can be you know escalated by by the the, the women also. I still say there's never a point where a woman deserves to be uh, be beaten, uh, uh, you know, by a man. But where's the counseling? Where do where do we as families? Where do we as um, as as a community begin to step up and and play a role in helping? You know, in in, in our culture, in the in the wedding ceremonies. One of the warnings or messages that is put out there to to all the people there is that that the community now has a responsibility to this to this 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 brand new union, and the responsibility is to help them. The women are warned, no, this man is off limits now, and and the men are warned that this woman is off limits. You, these these two are, are a couple, and and it's the responsibility of the entire community to help them through their problems, not to cause them. Not to be dragging, uh, you know, your buddy out you know, to drunken nights out. Not to be dragging your your girlfriend out. Not to be doing any of that stuff. I mean, look, I'm not saying that that you that people have to live in a bubble here, but we should not be doing the things that that are going to cause tension in a relationship. You know, least of all trying to, you know, seduce you know somebody, you know, a man or a woman who's already involved in a relationship. That's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is is when you uh, you look the other way, when you know your your buddy, your your drinking buddy, it, it, you know after after a night out, you guys all have a good time. He comes home and it beats the crap out of perhaps his his his, his wife or his kids. If you continue to socialize with that individual, knowing that your that your your nightlife is contributing, then you're not you're not just an innocent bystander. You're complicit. You're actually aiding and abetting. You're you're part of the problem. And again, if you're a mother of a son who's beating on uh, on his uh, the mother of his children, if you're if you're a you know uh, a sister or an aunt or a father or an uncle or or a, or a brother, we all have a role that we can play, and we can all try to to, to smooth these things out and to and to help. Whatever conflicts arise in you know, and look, and if in a situation where there there are irreconcilable differences, then you've, you then you have a responsible way of 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 making that relationship, you know, uh, uh, go separate. And you make sure that, and we all have a responsibility making sure that both the mother and the father still do right by the children. So. Before I get into 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 some of the you know, the the root causes of the domestic violence issue and the missing and murdered Indigenous women issue, and I got to remind people, this isn't just about women. We have men and young boys, young men and boys, who are also the the victims of uh, of this uh, of this violence, in, including you know, sexual violence. I mean, th- they're based on a, a proportion. Native men have the highest rate per, for our population. I, I know the total numbers aren't big, but for, for our population, we have the highest rate of death by cop. Death by cop. Native people. There's only one age demographic, and I think that's the 16 to 21-year-old. Uh, I think black males surpass um, how many deaths per 100,000 in, in the population there is. But we're I mean, we're obviously way above uh, above where where white people are. In total, there may be more white people killed by cops than, than any other group, but but because there's more white people. But as a proportion of our of our population, we even go above. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying this to brag, but we even go above uh, the, the number of black men per hundred thousand that are that are killed by by cops. So that's a problem, and that's a and that disproportionate. Um, disproportionality is 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 due to racism and in fact our our own complicity in violence against women 
oftentimes comes because of influence from the outside. Look, the, the male dominance culture, that was a European thing. The rape culture that came from Europe, and make no mistake about it, <laughs> there was a strong rape culture, rape, you know, from day one, Christopher Columbus and his men raping the raping women, young young women, uh, in in the Caribbean. Captain Cook, as he uh, as he navigated the Pacific and the uh, the Polynesian islands and Hawaii, the rape culture and the amount of um, uh, sexually transmitted diseases that came with these uh, with, with these men of Christ. Yeah, these these church going Christians from the Christian nations of Europe. Yeah. Even though they can look down at native people as something less than human, they had no problem having sex uh, having sex with uh, with our with our young women. So that rape culture and that and that idea and 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 to be honest, let's be clear here: rape is not about sex. Rape is about violence. So that rape culture, that violence against women culture that came from Europe, oh, it found a home in our territories as well. Male dominance, the idea that all of a sudden we start elevating chiefs as if they're uh, as if they're gods, not servants of the people, but lords over the people, and this whole idea of man and his castle stuff that all came from Europe. That wasn't our culture, but it becomes ours, and that leads that paves the way for this idea that that even a sub an oppressed people like Native people could have oppression within their culture. So now a native man can oppress, his, uh, oppress a native woman. We, we can look at our, our children as property. We look at, our, at the women in our community as property. That's not something that was our culture. And we've got to get rid of that. We've we got to shed that off. So that's some of the responsibility that we have to take on about our own behavior. Now, I'm not saying we have to do that first before we address the violence that's being perpetrated by the outside. No, I'm saying we have to do it at the same time. So I think that it's really important to understand that. But see, the other thing that, that some of the underlying problems are the problems that exist on our territories because of the outside. I mean, the, the poverty on our territories, the lack of hope on our territories, the, the lack of pros, uh, having a prospect for the future. See, that stuff's been, been wiped out because of, colonialism because of, of racism uh, you know white supremacy i mean that's why if you look on our territories we lead in 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 many of the categories almost all the categories that you don't want to lead in you know uh, uh high school dropout rate although i'm not sure that a high school diploma uh, serves us that well anyway but the idea that we don't finish school we don't pursue education the idea that uh or, or teen pregnancy um uh, substance abuse Suicide. Yeah, and, and, and again, when, when we talk about suicide, when we talk about suicide and running away, this is a, a place that gets a little murky. Because oftentimes when we talk about missing and murdered indigenous women, many of those murders, the, the, the authorities, the outside authorities, are saying, oh, the, the, uh, she probably just killed herself. I mean, that's, I, mean I know specifically, you know, I, I've got you know, a, a friend who's a very strong activist whose sister, she was on her way to go to fashion school in, in Paris, and somehow she, uh, um, she, she fell from a, uh, a balcony, I don't know, 30 or 40 floors up at a hotel in Toronto. And the authorities tried to say she committed suicide. And there was no way that she committed suicide. And there was never a proper investigation on who was at that party that was in this hotel, uh, in this hotel room. But it's a, it's a kind of thing. We have... T time and time again, we have a, a woman who turns up, um, whose whose remains are found, and they say, and they'll try to write it off as a as a suicide. Same thing when we say uh, when we have missing women, missing our young women. Look, I know many cultures have a problem with with with, with young girls running away and and young young men. So the idea of having runaways is is a very real problem. But regardless of whether a, a, a child is a runaway or not, it shouldn't change the, the process of investigating and trying to find out whether they're runaway because there's always that chance that they aren't a runaway, that they are the victims of a crime. They are the victims of, of a kidnapping or an abduction or the, the sex uh, trades, you know, slave trade. I mean, there's always that, pro that possibility. 
And and of course, if you track back both the, the I mean, and there are real suicides too. I mean, I want to diminish that. I mean, we, we lead in that category. But there's a reason we have suicides and there's a reason we have runaways on our territories. And, and it goes back to the fact that our territories have been designed to be uh, oppressive. They, they were designed to be impoverished. They were designed to marginalize us as a people. And when you marginalize the people, you don't just marginalize the adults. Worse yet is you create an environment where, where children have very little to look forward to. And so that's, that's the problem. I mean, that, that's what leads to um, risky behavior, uh, bad behavior. Yeah, and that's why we get into the, the substance abuse problems and, um, and so many of these other things. And, and, and you can't blame anybody, young or old, for living in, a, in an environment that is so unconducive to happiness that they try to get out. And, and I'll tell you, that, that attempt to get out can also place people in very vulnerable situations. And so when we talk about missing and murdered indigenous women and men, we have to address the conditions on our territory that make life there undesirable. Sometimes so so undesirable that 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 we take our own lives. Sometimes so undesirable we find you know any means possible to um, uh, you know, to to chemically um, you know, uh, affect uh, our our minds. So we find euphoria in any way that we can. We have to do more. So and and again. I know why the situation exists. I know how we got here. But as we do, as we go forward, we got to figure out, well, how do, how do we take responsibility to fix some of these problems? And I'm not, not letting the state, state governments or the federal government or anybody else, uh, any of the corporate interests that are, that are always hanging around our territories to, to come in and drill for oil or dig for minerals or you know, run a highway through our territories or whatever else. I'm not letting them off the hook. But... If we have are more responsible about where we see our, our the vision of the of the future, then it will change how we deal with those in, those those institutions, the corporate institutions, the federal government, the, the state government. These are all the things that we need to begin to take more control of and, and take more into consideration, because it does affect our children. It does affect. Again, we get it's it's you can follow that line back. In almost every circumstance where where we have a a, a missing a woman or or a murdered woman, you, in almost every one of those circumstances, you you can follow it back to uh, um, to tragedy that led to that tragedy. So these are the things that we need to do. These are the things that we need to start pecking away at and improving. Every child should have hope for the future. Because, and, and, and this is a, a well-known fact, it isn't adversity that causes change. It's hope. When you realize that there is an alternative, that there are some things that we can do to change, if, if there's hope that you can affect change and, and improve things, otherwise you just, learn, you just learn how to deal with the fact that you're living in adversity. You don't change it. Uh, and perhaps you, uh, you know, uh, abuse drugs or, or, or alcohol, or you run away. There is no reason that, that people can't look at their territory and say, this is where I want to be successful. I don't need to go to the city. And no, I'm not condemning people who, who leave their territories and, and, and seek careers in, uh, you know, in the, in the corporate world. But it, that shouldn't be the only o- option for success. We should have our own ways of measuring success on our territories. We should have our own way of measuring who is or what is a successful person, young man, young woman. We we need to make sure that we we have careers that can be pursued on our territories. We don't want, I mean, if, if all we do is look for our best and brightest and send them off, say, oh, you go off and get be successful. So what are we going to do? We're going we're to leave all the people who don't want to do a damn thing on our territory. So we, we want to deplete our gene pool to the point that all we have left are the ones who have lost hope. 
No, we need to have a, we need to have hope on our territories. We need to have success on our territories. Look, the world's a different place than it was. I mean, our territories are fairly remote. Look, I'm talking to you from the Cattaraugus Territory of the Seneca Nation, which is, you know, got Buffalo in the backyard. Toronto's not far. We got Cleveland. We got Syracuse. You know, we're not far, even that far from New York City. So, yeah, we're not the most remote territory here. But clearly, there are some territories that are pretty remote. And that, I mean, that geography sometimes can be very oppressive. Look, there are some places that I've traveled to, other native territories, that are unbelievably beautiful. But that beauty and that rawness of that beauty can only carry you so far when you're trying to feed yourself and you're trying to to enjoy your life. So we need to understand that in order to, to fix any of the social ills on our territories, we have to be able to provide hope for the future. And look, gaming was one of those things that, oh yeah, we do we do a casino and that's going to solve the problem. Look, that doesn't solve the problem. That's a pretty one-dimensional fix and it doesn't work in every, every territory. But I'll tell you, one of the things that should happen is that we should have better um, uh, cooperation and, uh, and relationships from territory to territory. I mean... Look, if one territory doesn't provide the the resources and and uh, for a, a career that that somebody on another territory may be pursuing, then we don't necessarily need to lo- lose our people to the, you know to to the world out there. We could have programs from territory to territory. We want to learn certain agricultural skills. Uh, you know, go to an area that's got a good ag pro- uh, uh, program. You want to learn. Um, you know, forestry and, you know, and wildlife management and environmental issues, all that stuff. I mean, look, some territories are, are suited for, for, for careers better than others, but we should be coordinating that from territory to territory. These are the kinds of things that we need to give. And, and look, this isn't the tribal government that's necessarily got to do it. Well, look, we, we are the people, right? We can do these things. We don't need permission. We and oftentimes we don't even need you know some you know some oppressive grant system that we have to go through to, to start some some of the stuff is, a, is picking up the phone, connecting on the computer and and making those relationships. Most of these things start by just by networking. Networking is 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 cheap if not free, and these are the kind of things that we need to do. And and I'll tell you that networking applies to everything, not only for for careers and opportunities and hope. But also that same networking is, is the kind of thing we need to do when we find ourselves in, uh, in, uh, challenged by adversity, whether it's, a, you know, whether it's a rash of suicides or runaways or, you know, again, this missing and murdered indigenous women issue. We should have a better network from territory to territory. My friend uh, Sogoyeta, James, when I, was on a couple of shows ago, and what he, what he, his observation is that this whole thing seems to be uh, fought by women. There's very few men involved. Well, the men need to step up. We need to play a role. And, and again, as I said at the beginning, the first place that we play a role is making sure that our buddies aren't, aren't part of the problem and that we aren't part of the problem. Look, behind me, uh, if, for those of you who are watching on, uh, on Facebook Live, behind me is my, um, that's my design for the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women uh, flag. Um, uh, and... I still, uh, that's a banner that I had printed, but I haven't really gone into a print shop to get the flags done yet. But that's what I'm working on. I mean, it's, it's one of my small contributions to the cause that, uh, that I'm, uh, and I'll probably have to do more of a contribution because I'll probably have to help fund getting the flags done uh, and distributed. But that's one of the things that I'm doing. And of course, trying to give a voice to these issues is, the, is, is again, a part of what, what I try to do. And we can all do more. You know, I, I'll, but I'll tell you, starting at home, I'm a responsible husband, I'm a responsible father, and a responsible grandfather. I have not just, uh, you know, I, I, I have women in my family, uh, you know, down to my, to my granddaughters. And, uh, and, of course, young men as well. And the role that we play in our families, you know, I, I don't have, you know, four or five baby mamas. I have one. <laughs> and, you know, these are the kinds of things that we, we need to be more responsible to, uh, you know, uh, towards to, to, to fix some of this problem. So, you know, I can't say that I've done it all right, but um, yeah, I've done it mostly right.
and and we we need to do more. Look, we're at the bottom of the hour, so we're going to take a break and come back. And and I, I want to talk more. I want to talk about some of the outside forces too. I mean, I've taken taken our I beat up our own people pretty good in this first segment, but I'll, I'll talk about what we're facing on the outside as well when we come back. This is John Kane, and this is Let's Talk Native. To this total recognition and make this my mission a statement of rendition our women murdered and missing with falsified conviction it wasn't their decision to be held against their will to mentor raped and killed this issue is very real but the media's making deals these statements they give me chills made slaves in the sex trade or addicted popping pills it's crazy they may say anything to conceal Okay, provoke haze, but the truth don't get revealed. And I must say, till this day, I would never yield. To escape from this place gets more and more unreal. With today's hate at these rates, over a thousand to a meal. So don't wait to take fate from the highways to the hills. While moms mourn and stay torn, can't imagine how they feel. Just know you're not alone, the power of truth they cannot steal. Together we will stand, together we will heal. Treated equal, you heard it all before, but this another sequel. Like an open sore, these wounds can be lethal. Guess I just needed to get it off my chest. Knowledge is power, and I'm trying to do my best. I'll never let you down, I will earn your respect. And keep on fighting for rights to the day of my death. To all my people, you're not alone deep in this mess. For the ones who suffer from addiction, these are the steps. For the ones locked up in prison, try to channel the stress. Try to remain strong while I gather up the rest And keep on pushing on till there ain't nothing left I know it ain't shown and you listen we belong To all our native women who mysteriously gone And maybe you'll live long, your legacy lives on This is more than just a song, it's a message from beyond Ooh, it's time we spoke Alright, thanks for coming back uh, That's It's Time by Jay Fastcloud, another a uh, performer who has uh, done music and dedicated it towards uh, to missing and murdered Indigenous women. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors. I want to thank uh, Ross and Holly John and the RJE Family of Businesses. I want to thank Eric White and the RW Enterprises. Um, and um, those of, of you, who, and you know who you are, who uh, who support this program and help us do what we do here. Um, look, as I mentioned, uh, I, I've got this uh, image that I've had. You know, I, I, I worked on this a couple of years ago. And it was my intention to, you know, to try to raise some money and, and to do a large run of, of flags and get them out there. So any of, you know, I know there are those of you that support the show. And any of you want, um, if you if you thought you'd like to help with something specific, that's something that, uh, you know, certainly anybody who wants to help me uh, get flags printed, we could, uh, we could do that. And I my plan was never to make money off of it, uh, except for to possibly raise money for, victims of, uh, of violence and that kind of stuff. But um, uh, I would always just, uh, my plan would be to whatever revenue was generated to dump it back in to print more flags and get them distributed. And, and part of my inspiration for this, uh, this idea was the fact that I saw so many flags flying on our territory, not just American flags, but POW MIA flags, which is barely even a thing anymore. And, and again, I'm not, look, I'm not trying to dishonor anybody who's, who perhaps still has a loved one that's missing in action or a prisoner of war, although that's mostly a Vietnam era thing. I mean, but that flag is still very, very prominently flown on our territories while there is almost nothing that, uh, you know, that bears any um, resemblance to acknowledging the fact that we have a, uh, a missing persons problem ourselves, which uh, in the form of our missing and murdered indigenous women. So, um, 
But uh, again, I'm grateful for those of you who support the show. But that's a, just another area that, uh, that if I had the resources, and I probably will. Those of you who are supporting the show, I will probably use some of those dollars to at least do some some small runs and get uh, get some of these flies. I'm going to work with my, my friend James, as he indicated when he was on the show a couple of programs ago, that we're going to get some flags printed. Um, but, but I also want to take this time. I want to thank those of you who, uh, who share the show, who um, listen to the show. You share the, the video, the podcast, and you allow us to share the show on your Facebook um, group pages and that kind of thing. So I want to thank you guys for that. I want to thank my wife in particular for sharing this uh, our Facebook live stream on these um, uh, these various group pages to, to get the, the word out. All right. Um, look, a, a bit of an announcement. I do events in new york at the the last thursday of every of, of every month so um on may 30th i plan to show wind river which is a film that was meant to raise awareness about missing and murdered indigenous women it's to me it's not the greatest film uh it's got i have some some problems with it but it, it's not because it's not done well i mean it's a major motion picture it's got uh Jer- jeremy renner and i can't think of the, the who's the woman who played in um uh, she's she's doing the Avengers too. She's the the one who's uh, the the woman who's got like a I don't know magical or whatever else. What's her? Um, I can't think of her name, but her, it's Elizabeth oh, anyway. Yeah. Elizabeth Olsen. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So it's got Elizabeth Olsen. <laughs> That's a long way to get there. <laughs> Elizabeth Olsen and Jeremy Renner, two of uh, the stars of the Avengers films, um, who are in the, in this film. But which obviously means that the heroes are white people. Uh, so. Uh, I get it. They they bring in the big names for the to make them more of a box office success. But um, it's not a bad film. Um, there's some things I would have done differently, obviously. But uh, and it does highlight part of the problem. Um, and if you haven't seen the film, it's called Wind River. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna show the film on uh, May 30th at the Brooklyn Commons. It's 388 Atlantic Avenue. I'll probably show that we'll probably, you know, run it around seven, seven o'clock in the evening. Um, it, it, it is a decent film. Great, uh, you know, great visuals. Wind River is, a, you know, it's a beautiful place. Um, but it also shows some of the real problems that exist in a place where, where there may not be the hope. And you know, so it addresses some of what I talked about earlier. And it, it does get into a, a one issue, um, that kind of is what, uh, Murray Porter sings about in uh, Highway 16, which is also called the Trail of Tears, or the uh, uh, is it? No, Highway of Tears. And the reason it's called that is because it goes to, into Western Canada where they have these man camps set up for the extractive industries, whether it's oil, tar sands oil, whether it's you know uh, mining and that kind of thing. So they, so when I say a man camp, what I mean is a place where men leave their families, whether they're coming from back East or, you know, from California or wherever else they're, and they go to these remote areas to make lots of money because the pay is good. So these men leave their wives and their children and they go off to these remote places and where there's only men except for the locals. And the environment that gets created there is one where these guys feel like they're in a different world and they don't have to behave the same way they would behave around their own families, perhaps. And they can be, the boys can be boys kind of thing. Well, and this is where many women find themselves be, becoming victims of, uh, of these, these testosterone filled man camps. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's plenty of um, data suggesting that, that there's been sex, uh, a sex slave trade that goes uh, that, that's associated with these things. But even without there being orga- that kind of level of organization associated with it, there's, there's clearly abuses take place. You know, and, and so this is this idea that the extractive industry brings in people who can behave a completely different way because they feel like they're in this remote area that they're not going to get in trouble for. So and I need to talk about that. See, here's the problem. When you look at these, some of these areas, there's no police forces. And, you know, if you take a place like South Dakota, you know, or, or on the Canadian side in Alberta, there's not a population that's going to support, uh, you know, a, a large uh, contingent of uh, provincial police or state police in some of these states. You may only have a few officers covering, you know, huge, you know, um, areas of land. So it's not like 
anybody who would take it for granted, they, you know, I'm in trouble. I can just call 911 and the police are going to be there. No, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. And, and if you're native, now you have a racial barrier. Not only you have a geographical barrier, you know, you've got, you've got a racial barrier. And the fact of the matter is, almost no, there are almost no prosecutions of violence against, against native women. And native courts, to the extent that they exist, you know, tribal police, if you want to call them that or whatever, they can't prosecute white people for committing crimes against uh, native people. It's prohibited. I mean, yeah, they do, they're doing a little pilot program, part of the Violence Against Women Act that you know, has to struggle to get through Congress every year. They did a little pilot program where a few um, territories that have police that, that are deemed worthy enough or, or white enough, <laughs> I should say, can, uh, that the, 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 you know, this piece of legislation allowed them to, to dabble with the idea of, um, of uh, prosecuting, indicting, prosecuting, and, and even um, uh, imprisoning uh, non-Native people. But that's the exception to the rule. And so the standard has been that if you live in an area that is a, as remote as many Native territories are, and even when there's not, they aren't remote, like for us here, you still end up with this whole, this, the racial barriers that exist. The idea that you're going to, that, that a white police force or, or a non-native police force, let's put it that way, is going to prosecute a, um, uh, a non-native person for committing a crime against a native person. It just doesn't happen that often. Because there, there are these racial, you know, not just racial profiling, but these racial injustices that exist. So, I mean, and then you get into ju- these jurisdictional battles because native territories, if they do have tribal police, they don't have prosecutorial uh, powers, and, and the courts don't. So who does? The state police isn't going to provide resources. So you get the feds involved. Now you got an FBI issue. So you, you have this whole battle over jurisdictions that, that if some things aren't, you know, uh, they have a, a, you know, they don't meet certain criteria, and they aren't gonna, they're not going to investigate. They'll send somebody out to check a box, but that's about as far as any of it goes. So part of the problem that we have with violence against uh, our our women is apathy. We the state doesn't care, the feds don't care. I mean, there's a certain you know the the unspoken stuff is that well, it's only native people. And sometimes it's not just unspoken; it is spoken. So if and so this is where I, I say someone comes back to us because if we aren't prioritizing this issue enough, it makes it hard for us to uh, to force others to prior prioritize it. And, but you know what? We also can play a role in protecting our, our, our women, our young, our young men, our young women. We should play more of a role. You know, if, if you know that your, your daughter is in a violent situation, you know, I'm sorry, dad and brothers, it's time you stepped up. We have a responsibility. We're supposed to be the warriors protecting our, protecting our women and our children. We certainly shouldn't be the ones put, placing them in danger, and we shouldn't be the ones looking the other way. And I know, I know. Sometimes, you know, trying to help uh, help, help a woman who's in a in a um, a domestic violence relationship is tough because you know I, I've been there. I've I've been there, and I've seen how sometimes women respond when you uh, um, when you try to help them. But somebody has to be the adult in the room. Somebody has to be the uh, the people to say no. This this ends now. So I, you know, again, I I have to call some of back just because we're not going to get the support from the federal government. We're not going to get the support from the state government, and 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 tribal governments are oftentimes just to the extent that they're not already extensions of the of the province or the state government. They're not going to do much either. You know, I've I've talked about the doll test. If you don't know what the doll test is. The doll test is this um, uh, is this experiment experiment that's been done. It's been done with with dolls, and it's been done with even with flashcards, where where children, even ch- children who who aren't even necessarily old enough to go to school yet, are are asked, and these are little girls and little boys, and, and they start out with white kids, right? They say, "What's the pretty doll?" And and they'll have a black doll and a, and a, and a white doll, and the, and the pretty doll is the white doll. What's the good doll? The, the, the white doll is the good doll. What's the bad doll? The bad baby. And 
invariably, it's it is it becomes so predictable that the white child is going to pick think that everything is good about the white doll and everything is bad about the black doll. The problem is when you bring the black child in, the black child has already been conditioned to believe believes that the white the white the white doll is better. It's prettier. It's good. It's it's the one you want to be. the The only difference is when you ask the white girl which which doll is more like you, the white girl is going to say that well the the uh, the white doll is more like me. Well, the only the only time that the uh, the black child picks the black doll is when they say, which one's more like you. So it's already in the mind of a black child, and this can be done with any race, because the dominant culture around us is already pre- preconditioning us to believe what is good and what is bad. So. And the reason I bring this up is when you look at a policeman, it almost doesn't matter if a policeman is, is, is white or black. They've already been conditioned that if they see a crowd of white boys or a crowd of black boys, the black boys are the, are the, uh, the, the white boys are only a frat, right? they're a fraternity. The black boys are a gang. And so we get, we get conditioned. And, and Native people the same way. We, we automatically can look at white people as somehow being better than us. And we've got to battle that back. And we have to not have these preconceived notions about our, our, about our women, about our young girls, and about our men. Even if, you know, look, even if they are meeting, you know, or, or, or aren't reading, reaching a standard that we want them to reach. If we've already lowered the bar, they'll never reach that standard. We have to expect more. We have to give more. We have to do more. And we can't fall prey to the prejudices that they're holding against us because we've been conditioned by the same environment that they have been. By the media, by Hollywood, by mascots. The whole idea of sexualizing Native women, I mean, it, it goes back you know, to, the, you know, to the first black and white movies. They were already sexualizing women, and they weren't even real Native women. <laughs> but they had white women dressed up as Native women. They were already sexualizing our women back then. They did it through all the Westerns. And they, Disney does it. Pocahontas, uh, bare shoulder, high slit up the skirt. Pocahontas is only 12 years old, romantically involved with some, uh, some old white dude who in history never had happened. She was never involved with, with John Smith. But that's not the way Disney tells the story. Nope, sexualize it. Sexualize it all. Then we got, you know, so not only do you have uh, Disney doing that with Pocahontas, then you, then you have um, Donald Trump, you know, mocking, uh, you know, mocking the name and the person. Not just the Disney cartoon, but, but there's a real person there who was, who was kidnapped, raped, and indoctrinated, married off, got sick and died. That's, that's the history of, of Pocahontas. And now you got Donald Trump that'll that'll you know mock Elizabeth Warren calling calling, calling her Pocahontas. And then, so what's the retort? Bill Maher gets on the gets on his politically incorrect show and says, "Well, considering how much money Donald Trump lost a, a billion dollars over ten years, they should call him Brokahontas." Well, I'm sorry, that's still mocking. I mean, it, it's still it's it's still mockery. I mean, I, everybody thinks it's funny and that kind of thing. No, I, I was insulted by that. And I'm not, a, it's not because I'm a huge Pocahontas fan. I mean, I think they're, I don't consider that Pocahontas to be this significant historical figure in, in, in Native history. I don't. I mean, I, uh, the only thing that makes her famous is the fact that white people kidnapped her and, 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 and indoctrinated her, changed her name to Rebecca, married her off to a tobacco baron, not John Smith, but John Rolfe. I mean, that's to me. She she didn't have this legacy of doing something phenomenal for Native people. I mean, she she died before she before she could even raise her own child. So, I mean, we have been plagued with this this whole idea of uh, how we how we treat how we treat our own women and how we expect them to be treated. I mean, I don't know. But, I know there's, there are people who are indifferent about um, uh, the relationships that, are, that our kids get into and what's acceptable. Well, I'll, I'll tell you. I mean, we should be outraged if anybody lifts a hand, uh, a, a violent hand to our, uh, 
to our women. I don't care if they're I don't care if they're married to them or not. But this this is the where we need to step up. We need to do more to you know to combat the uh, all of the, the the negative things in our lives that uh, that that dash the hopes of our of our young people. I mean, even the movie Wind River talks about how there's so very little uh, you know very little to, for for some of the people to do in a remote area like Wind River. But even in areas that aren't remote, look here in the Seneca Nation. One of the, and I don't know how accurate the census information is or this data that gets collected, but by by one uh, survey that was done, they said uh, even in the Seneca Nation here, thirty percent of the uh, of the people live below uh, below the poverty line. I mean, they're all they're all rich because they got casinos. See, yeah, you know, as the state rapes them for another billion dollars. Now we're li- we're living in, in in situations where even in the most affluent native territories. We still have um, tremendous, you know, tr- tremendous, tremendous so- social in- in- injustices. Whether it's you know our interaction with the police, whether it's um, our interaction with, with with schools, whether it's our interaction with uh, um, with outside law enforcement in general, not just police, but regulatory issues. Look, we're in a we're in a constant battle as Native people, fighting for our our free and independent existence, sovereignty, as some people call it. But fighting for our distinction. And of course, if being native doesn't afford you or doesn't reward you some sense of pride, if you if being a native person doesn't fulfill you because you've already got it built in your mind that being native means being poor or being without or or, or not having a future. I mean, ironically, if you look at some of the most successful native writers, uh, filmmakers, performers, <laughs> I hate to say it, but many of them were raised by white people. Their biggest battle oftentimes is, is trying to make it back to reconnect with their own people. Buffy St. Marie. I mean, and, 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 and again, I'm not condemning her or anybody else. I mean, I've, I've looked at some of the people who are, who are journalists. Uh, people who are you know are, are involved in television, theater, I mean all that stuff. But we don't do a whole lot with our own people on our own territories. So we have to make sure that we provide the best hope for the future of, uh, for our, for our young people. That's the answer to missing and murdered Indigenous women. Look, I'm I I will advocate in the strongest way possible that we. Um, investigate this problem more thoroughly, that we uh, throw more resources at it, that we do everything we can to make sure that every every Native person, man, woman, or child, whatever, who turns up missing, that we pursue and find out what happened to them. That we, we don't accept the, a, a shortcut to, to writing them off as a suicide or a runaway. No, I, we need to do everything possible. We need to do everything possible to protect our people. And, and it's not even to say who the boogeyman is, whether it's us or whether it's them or whoever it is. But we need to do more. We need to do, to do the most. We need to do everything that is humanly possible to make sure that we provide a future for future generations. And again, we've, you, can, you can track some this missing and murdered indigenous women thing right back to residential schools. And we were somewhat culpable there too. Yeah, there were there were children that were ripped from homes, but there were also children that were that that people let their children go to these schools, encouraged it, supported it. I mean, the Thomas Indian School. How did that exist here on Seneca Nation territory? I mean, you had you you had a new religion that was supposed to be grant you know you know uh, taking taking hold here in the Code of Handsome Lake coming in the early eighteen hundreds. By the mid 1800s, it was a thing. You had the Senecas that, you know, adopted a new constitution, and at the same time, you you have this residential school that has that has its own legacy of abuse, and of course, other schools all over the U- U.S. and Canada that were doing the same thing, indoctrinating our people, assimilating our people, kill the Indian, save the man, 
and and not just kill the the essence of Indian. No, it was killing them. We had, we had people dying in these schools. So when you wonder where does missing and murdered indigenous women start, it starts back then. That's where the, some of the the first victims were not from extractive industries. They they were from uh, from kill the Indian, save the man. There's a long legacy of this abuse. There's a long legacy of everything from from bounties to uh, I mean I'm, look if you have to tr- if you have to look at the history and find out when uh, when it was no longer legal to hunt native people and get paid for it it's not that long ago folks especially if you if you look out west as as westward expansion going yeah what might have seemed you know um, unacceptable in the east it was <laughs> when they talk about the wild west that's why thirty eight Dakota could be hung by the neck. Execution order signed by Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator. You think so, huh? And I'll still debate people. Still, people will still debate, well, the reason that they were hung is because they, they massacred white people. No. They raided white villages that were set up on their territory because they were starving. And why were those white people on their, their territory? Because of Abraham Lincoln signing the Homestead Act. This is how twisted. I've heard some of our own people try to justify the fact that 38 Dakota were hung by the neck. And the rest of the 300 who were prosecuted died in prison. We get our own minds twisted around with these things. I've, I've listened to people suggest that, uh, well, you know, that's, you know, the reason we have so much violence against women is because of our, our, because of our own behavior. Look, I address that. And and I I don't disagree that that we because of our circumstance don't necessarily have the best practices. But I'm not bl- I'm not victim shaming our own people. I will never do that because the very the very reason some of these bad practices and bad behaviors are developed is because of the, of the, of the racism and the oppression that our people have have experienced. So no, there's no easy way to say, okay, well, it's your own fault. So you, you get what you get. No, that, that's, a, that's an unacceptable answer. And it's particularly unacceptable coming from our own people. Because the only people who will say that are the ones who aren't willing to do a damn thing to fix it. So I'm with my friend uh, Sogayeta, James. We need to do more. Men need to do more. I mean, there's a certain absurdity that, you know, that I designed a flag uh, that I thought would help raise awareness to this issue. Now it's been five years since I designed the flag. Five years. And I haven't been able to uh, generate the funds or raise the money to, to get them printed. And you know, look, I could have printed off one or two, and I did a few banners. And I'll do it on my own if I have to. But the fact that, that we've had, look, we've got millionaires on our territories. We've got people all over the place. You know, And, I, and I'm grateful to the few that, that support the show that I do here. But when I think about the amount of money that have been that has been has been wasted from gaming, from tobacco, from fuel, from all of the businesses that we've had been successful on, that we've never properly allocated funds to to address the problems that plague our people, including uh, the problems that plague uh, the safety and security of our women. I'm going to leave you with a, with a couple of numbers that get thrown out there all the time. A native woman has a fifty fifty chance of being sexually assaulted or raped in their lifetime. One out of every two Native women you see is is likely to have been uh, raped or sexually assaulted. It's one in four for anybody else, uh, a woman in college, for instance. But these numbers are unacceptable. And again, 70% of the violence committed against our women uh, is committed by by non-Native people which means 30% are, are, are our own people. And I'm not going to, you know, dismiss that 70% and say, well, we got to work on the 30. No, we need to work on the 30, and we need to protect our women from that 70. So, uh, look, I'm going to address this issue more as we go forward and, uh, and bring some guests on to, to join me to talk about that. I'll get James and a few others who are working on this and um, uh, try to get some of the, the heads of some of the organizations who, that are out there. And I know... Just like with anything else, it is hard to to necessarily know what are the organizations that are doing the most uh, you know proactive work on this stuff. And I'm going to try to flesh some of that out and uh, and present some of that information here on the show. So 
look forward to that. And uh, and again, I'm going to get some flags done, and I'll get them out there. Just know that when you do see this flag, and should it become the iconic symbol to represent uh, this, this problem, uh, just know where it came from, and uh, and and know that some good work can come from people and from some unexpected places. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. See you next time.